Welcome, Kidlit Campers. Today, I am excited to introduce you to Sharon Skinner. And I've known Sharon for a while and uh, been very privileged to call her both a friend and a colleague. And I am going to introduce you more formally to Sharon with her bio. Uh, Sharon holds a BA in English, an MA in Creative Writing, and is a certified book coach and freelance editor. She helps writers weave their words into stories that shine. Sharon mainly writes fantasy, science fiction, paranormal, and the occasional steampunk for audiences of all ages. Sharon is an active member of the SCBWI and serves as the regional advisor in Arizona. She also served aboard the USS Jason, the first US Navy vessel to take women to sea. And that's another story, but it's pretty awesome. <laughs> To learn more, you can also find her at SharonSkinner.com and BookCoachingBySharon.com. So welcome, Sharon. Hi there, Sarah. It's so fun to be here. I'm excited to talk to you today. Yes, I was so excited to have you here because um, your wheelhouse is in the specific area where I tend not to live all that often. And so I thought you would be a great person to have here to uh, share your expertise with us. And so um, just to sort of lay some groundwork here, maybe I should have you start off by, by saying how you would define speculative fiction. Okay, so the caveat here is that it is a moving target as many genre tend to be, especially overarching uh, genre. But the, and, and you will get a variety of opinions from all over the place. For me, speculative fiction is really the things that you listed out of my bio all fall under speculative fiction. So fantasy, uh, paranormal, and steampunk, all of those kinds of things, because they're not things that could really happen. There are things that we ask a what if question about. There are people who will tell you that, that apocalyptic falls under speculative fiction, uh, but there are also people who say that if it's a possibility that it could really happen, it's not really speculative fiction. So that means that when we talk about science fiction, hard science fiction may not be what we would consider speculative fiction, according to some folks, while space opera, your Star Wars kinds of things that have some pretty bizarre things that happen that are not science-based are probably speculative fiction. So it, it really depends on who you talk to, but a lot of people will lump fantasy, science fiction, paranormal, apocalypse, uh, post-apocalyptic, uh, things like that, uh, all under speculative fiction. I know horror is its own genre, but horror originated under spec fic. So really speculative fiction was kind of the catch-all for many, many years of all the things that didn't fall under fiction. There was fiction and then there was speculative fiction. You, and I know you've heard me talk about the slicing and the dicing of, uh, of genre out in the world and how that's happened over time. You know, once upon a time, there was kids books and adult books. There were fiction and nonfiction, and that was pretty much it. And uh, we've sliced and diced that to a point where uh, now it's there are just so many pieces, parts to that. But that's really all about enabling us to target the correct readers and buyers of the work and for it, marketing and booksellers to be able to place it or for librarians to place it where people can find what they're looking for. So it's a moving target. It's It shifts all the time. And I'm sure that by the time that people are listening to this or when people listen to this, they will have looked at someone else's opinion on what spec fic is. And there may be some differences, but that's how I define it. Yeah, no, I'm really glad that you um, made the distinction with the science fiction as well, because I was going to ask if science fiction would fall in that category. And that that's really interesting. And it seems like speculative fiction would be kind of this umbrella of categories that could easily be mashed with other genres. Like you could have a, a fantasy mystery or a paranormal romance, for instance. And uh, so that's all very interesting. Yeah, um, and you can, and there are lots of mashups of genre and people are combining genre. There, I think one of the most famous, and she's not a kid lit author, but one of the most famous uh, versions of that is Diana Gabaldon. And she actually 
they didn't know people didn't know where to put her work yeah. They, they, the booksellers didn't know where to shelve it. So you might go into a bookstore and find it in several places. You might find it in historical romance. You might find it in uh, science fiction for time travel. You might find it under, you know, other, you know, historical fiction. There, it's because she mashed so many things into it, yeah. but um, that doesn't mean you can't do it. It means, it, it just means that when the time comes to get your work out into the world or when you're querying, especially when you're querying agents and editors, that you at least know what you're mashing up so that you can be sure to let them know so that they know where you think it fits in the world, because that's the most important component to naming your genre. Yep. Yep. That makes sense. So as an author, because I know you write in the speculative fiction space, what is it about spec fic that you enjoy writing? So I'm I'm a big time I fantasy reader and uh, science fiction reader. I've been you know reading those things all my life. I started as a very young reading um, fantasy science fiction. Of course, I'm a very broad and very eclectic reader, so I, I'm very voracious. I'll read across the board. I read everything. I'll read contemporary. I'll read women's fiction I'll read I, there are a few things I don't read generally unless someone highly recommends it I'm not into graphic horror or things like that um thrillers I'll read one here and there but they're not my cup of tea normally but um but I'm very much into fantasy and the what ifs and the kinds of stories that can be told in a new another realm and one of the reasons for that is because i feel like we can really explore things that take place in the real world our relationships our um our belief systems how we treat people but we can do it with a little bit of an arm's distance when we set it in another world if we're writing fantasy uh we can actually get a little bit of distance from the issue in a way that makes it more palatable, I think, for most readers, so that it's not being, you're not being hit in the face with the types of prejudice that you see or the types of uh, behaviors that you see in these stories. And so uh, for me, that's a key component of why I like speculative fiction, because you can explore those kinds of things and it doesn't have to be in the real world. Also, I like rewriting my own personal history in ways that are more palatable to me because, you know, life can be a challenge, especially when you're a teenager and especially when you're younger. And I find that it's really nice for me to be able to go back and rewrite my own story in a sense, because I'm porting myself into these characters and into these worlds in ways that this is how I would like it to have been. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. And, you know, since we're talking about Kidlet, we would absolutely have to acknowledge that especially fantasy is just huge across the middle grade audience and the YA audience for sure. Um, why, why do you think that is? I think it's just a trend uh, for right now. I don't think it's a permanent trend. I know that um, 15, 20 years ago, we were all being told, no one wants fantasy. No one wants YA fantasy. Nobody wants that. You know, so, uh, and yet there are always readers for it. Mm -hmm. And when they, you know, when you hear from an agent or an editor, no one is looking for that right now, or nobody wants that. They're talking about themselves. They're not interested in it. It doesn't mean there aren't readers for it. I've always found readers. I've always found fans of my work. I've never had any trouble with once my work is out in the world, having people find it and love it and want more. So you have to take those things that you hear from people in the publishing industry with a bit of a grain of salt and also realize that those are current trends. I mean, how long, for how many years did we hear, no one wants vampires, we don't want any more vampire stories. And yet, every time you turn around, there's a new vampire story out there. You know, people are still interested in that. It's not going away. Yeah, I have, I have two young readers in my house and one of them loves fantasy, pretty much reads it I would say like 75% of what she reads is going to be in that fantasy 
space. And then my, my younger reader has no palette for it. It confuses him. <laughs> you know, he wants, he wants the, the hard facts, but uh, I do think there's something about um, the adventures that kids get to go on through fantasy that perhaps they don't get to experience if they're reading like a contemporary fiction they don't get swept away perhaps in the same way I agree I, that was going to be my next statement is that the magical component of I mean who doesn't want to go to another world and experience that completely especially when you're a kid yeah especially when you know the real world can be very confusing on its own it can be very there's, it can be very distraught and, and stressful, uh, even as a kid, especially as a kid right now, uh, there's a lot going on in the world that, and so escapist, uh, fiction is really a place that we want to go. And I always, as a kiddo wanted to go to another world. I didn't want to spend, I wanted to spend as little time in my own world as possible, to be honest with you. And fantasy did that for me, fantasy and science fiction. And I mean, also other stories like, um, I mean, the Island of the Blue Dolphins comes to mind. Stories about adventure where a young person is out on their own and having to survive and doing their own thing, no parental controls, those kinds of things. And you get a lot more of that in fantasy because you get to go through a portal and your parents aren't there, you know, and, and it doesn't have to be that your parents are missing or you're or you're in foster care or those kinds of real things that we know kids have to deal with, but you can escape that and you can go and go on an adventure and not have to worry about any of that mundane day-to-day -day stuff. And I think that, and that's honestly why I still read a lot of it because I like going away and to the, to another world and not having to deal with mundane stuff. Yeah, yeah. I think we can all, after the last few years, probably appreciate some form of escape <laughs> yeah. to some yeah. extent. So since you also coach writers, and um, would you generally advise your writers to kind of pick their lane within the spec fic? Like, is it helpful to a writer to know if they want to write a fantasy or a paranormal or you know, a different subcategory? Is it helpful for them to know that in advance? Or do you generally think they like to write the story and then you kind of figure out where it's going to fit? Generally, mm. how do you how do you approach that? Well, okay. So having started my career writing as a cancer, where I just wrote whatever came to mind because the voice is in my head, because everything I write is very character driven. Uh, some people come more from plot. I come more from character. Plot tends to be my nemesis. It's what I have to work on the most because my characters pretty much jump in my head and I know who they are and can follow them around. And I used to say that I followed them around like a journalist and wrote whatever they did. And I would come up to the computer and I would say, okay, today we're going into the woods. We're going over here. And my character would go, nope, we're going over there. And I learned to trust that and follow them because I've that's part of the subconscious process for me. That said, it can also be a trap to just pants your way through, especially as you get later in the story. So I always found that there was a certain point once I got to know my characters where I would then need to figure out what the plot is. What is this story? What is this journey for the characters? So I tend to write my way in initially, but that's when I know what the story is going to be. And Honestly, I think you kind of need to know at the beginning if it's paranormal, if it's fantasy, if it's science fiction, you really need to know world building and setting are critical to the story and what happens and what takes place. Um, actually, this Saturday, I'm teaching an entire workshop on world building and setting and how to develop a world that's real and how to ensure that that's place that your particular story could take place because if you're writing a story that's science fiction it's your world needs to reflect that the same thing with fantasy and the same thing with paranormal you know paranormal can be contemporary i have a contemporary ghost story mirabelle and the faded phantom but it is also paranormal because there's a ghost in it and 
I knew that that was taking place in the real world, the real world, except it's not because there's a ghost. And so I think you kind of have to know going in what kind of story that you are writing. I think that's really important. We, when we do the tools, use the tools that we have for the blueprinting of a book and things like that, which are really great tools. Genre is a big component of it, identifying the genre. And sometimes it's hard. And sometimes it's very hard for writers at first to say which genre they're writing in, especially now that everything is so sliced and diced into so many components. But I tell them when I coach, I tell them pick three, because on if you're listed on the big swooshy place, for when your books get listed out in the world, they'll list it under three categories or three genre. So they identify three placements or key placements for your book. So you want to at least identify what those three things are. And so I usually limit my writers to three. I'll say, okay, you can pick three. One has to be your main, you know, is it fantasy? Is it historical fantasy? Is it, you know, what are the other pieces that you put with it? You can mash up a lot of things, but you've got to have at least one main one. And I try to keep them to three in the in their um, total pick. Yeah. So I want to talk about one of these categories that I know that you write, and you might be the only person that I actually personally know who writes in the category of steampunk. And I'm just fascinated, um, fascinated by this genre. So, so Lauren's or Lost and Found, Sharon's, um, Sharon's steampunk middle grade is perhaps the only steampunk novel that I've read. It's just not one that uh, a category that I'm very familiar with, but um, so this fascinates me. <laughs> and so I don't know if you could just talk a little bit about steampunk because I don't think it's as common of something that we see. Steampunk is a, it's, there's a whole subculture of people who are into steampunk and steampunk is a very interesting genre and I love it. I love it for many reasons, but Part of the reason that I fell in love with it is because I really got into steampunk as a, as a role play and as something that I was doing. So I had a persona that I developed, Tavara Tinker, who is a steampunk character. And along with that, I had a whole line of repurposed clothing that I would take I would go to like the Goodwill and I would get these clothes and then I would redo them as steampunk costuming. And I had a, a local outlet where I was consigning that material, those costumes. And I would go to the big Comic Con and I would have a booth and sell, I mean, sell out all this stuff because it's very popular to that group of individuals. And there are tea battles and there are all sorts of wonderful things that surround the steampunk genre there's music there's I mean it's just a huge subculture of people who are very into steampunk we call Jules Verne the grandfather basically of steampunk because he was initially one of the first to write uh, stories that had steam driven machines and and gizmos and and mechanical things that did all these wonderful things and then as you got uh, you come forward during when i was younger uh the television show and then now the movies the wild wild west very very steampunk very more a lot the gadgets and things like that that really didn't exist but they exist in that world and so steampunk is an alternate historical reality too because the question, speculatively fiction-wise, is what What if, what if we never invented uh, diesel or or gas-powered engines and everything was were steam-driven? And so that's really where the idea of steampunk comes from, and that's really what drives the genre. Yeah, it, it's so interesting because it's it does have that feel of being both historical but also it almost feels a little sci-fi and it also feels a little fantasy. So it feels like it's a bunch of, a, bun a bunch of different things kind of rolled into one. Yeah. So, and, and one of the reasons that you see a lot of steampunk set in the Victorian era is because we're 
that historical aspect mm -hmm. of it. There were steam driven powered uh, machines back then before the combustion engine was invented. And so it's easy to place it there and kind of picture that and have your steam because you had steam locomotives and steam powered right. cars and steam powered uh, cotton gins and things like that. So it's kind of easy to place it there and use what's already in existence and then play off of there. Yeah, fascinating. Uh, we're wrapping up here on time, but before we do, um, do you have any advice for potentially new writers who maybe want to try their hand at speculative fiction? Maybe they haven't written that kind of story before. Do you have some general advice to get them started in the right direction? Well, you're going to get the same thing I always tell everyone. Read the genre. Read in the genre. Get familiar with it. Find out what the tropes are, what, what sort of standards are out there, what people are doing before you really want to embark upon it. You should be familiar with what the components are of it. Uh, for example, when you read Lost and Found, there are components that are very steam driven, but there's also a lot of other story to it. It's not right. just steampunk. That was just the setting that I wanted to place in there, partly because I wanted to have a mechanical fairy yeah. to <laughs> and, a, and and originally the idea was uh was actually uh the original name of it was TikTok Croc. And that was the idea because I wanted to write a story that was steampunk with a that was a mashup of Peter Pan and steampunk. And then I realized I had to set it in the Victorian area with steampunk. So I thought, ooh, Oliver Twist. So I kind of, you know, wrapped all those in there. So it's you can still mash things up. I have mashed up Peter Pan, Oliver Twist, and steampunk. Those don't seemingly go together. But in this book, they work. And I think they work pretty well. But um, yeah, get familiar with get familiar with it, whatever genre you are wanting to write in and explore, you should be familiar with it. Yeah. So campers, if you haven't already figured out, Sharon knows what she's talking about. She knows her stuff in the speculative fiction space and uh, definitely have a visit. Uh, you have both an author site at SharonSkinner.com where you have all your books, but then you also work with writers um, at your book coaching by Sharon.com. And I know that those are, if you find one, you can find the other. Um, and I should have also mentioned that Sharon is a co-host of a wonderful podca podcast called Coaching Kidlit, and uh, certainly have a listen to that. Uh, you have new episodes come out the first Wednesday of every month. Is that correct? First Wednesday of every month, we drop a new episode. Yeah. 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 And uh, I always listen. And uh, yeah, and I got to be a you. guest once. That was fun. <laughs> it was a good episode. We had a really good time. And uh, is, is there any other way that we can support you? Uh, you want to point people to any direction in particular? I think if you're writing in the speculative fiction space that you should, uh, well, I would hope you would sign up for my monthly newsletter. I have a monthly newsletter that goes out. It includes links to whatever I've been blogging about or talking about or um, what have you. But it also includes a a couple of things that you don't get if you just go to my website and read my blogs. I have one uh, writing tips section where I give tips about writing. And I have another section that is interesting things I found around the web around craft and writing. So those are things, those are only for the newsletter subscribers. And also, if you go to my website and subscribe through the pop-up, you will get a freebie because I have a freebie on there as well. So, Excellent. Well, thank you so much for joining us. And um, yeah, we'll have all the links to everything that we've talked about here uh, in the program notes. But uh, thank you, Sharon, for your time. Thanks for having me, Sarah. And have a great summer, campers. Keep writing. Bye, everybody.